Number 12 then, the last question from paper 2 in the 2018 Higher Mass, circles question. It's actually quite reminiscent of a circles question that was just a couple of years ago about a smaller circle in relation to a bigger circle. Anyway, you've got two circles here, C1 and C2, and you have their equations. That uses both of the forms there. For part A, what are the coordinates of the centre of C1? So one of the first things you do when you see equations, I usually just write down centres and radius whenever you can. So I will just borrow their names for their centres. So for the centre of C1, it's whatever's been subtracted. So that will be a 13 and a negative 4. The centre of C1, here it is, lies on the circumference of C2, the larger circle show that c is equal to negative 455. Well, if that centre lies in that circle, those coordinates fit that equation. So putting those into this equation should give the answer zero. So now it just looks at a lot of arithmetic for just one mark. So x is 13, so you've got 13 squared, and y is negative 4, negative 4 squared, plus 14 times 13, minus 22 times negative 4, plus c equals zero. Well, you could just type that lot into your calculator. But it does say show that c is equal to negative 455. So you can't really preempt the answer, so I better show some more arithmetic. Well, 13 squared, I know. 169. Negative 4 squared, that'll be plus 16. 13 times 14. Well, that's just one more 13 from 13 squared. So it'll be those two added. So that'll be plus 182 plus 88 plus c equals 0. Then you can add them up, but I'm just trusting that that comes to 455 plus c equals 0. It's only one mark all of this, so c is negative 455. B. Determine the ratio in which p divides, there's p there, the line joining the centres of the circles. Well, that just involves the radius of the large circle and the radius of the small circle. You know the radius of the small circle, maybe I'll just extract it here and give them the names 1 and 2. The radius of the small circle is where we 10, and the radius of the larger circle, well now that I know what C is, I can go through it all. I should maybe put down where its centre is as well at the same time, just borrowing the term C2, because if that's a positive 14, that'll be a negative 7, and if that's a negative 22, that'll be a positive 11. And the formula just uses the centre squared without any f's or g's or whatever. I'm just going to go straight in with the squares. Minus the number at the end, which was negative, so that's plus 455. That's quite a big pile of numbers. Same as this one. That's a 17 onto 62 square root of 625, so that's 15. Well, that means that this part is 10, not 25. One idiot. That part's 10, and that part's 15. Now, I'm not sure how much working you're meant to show for this part. Maybe we'll put this down. C2 to P is the radius of circle 2. Take away the radius of circle 1. So that equals 25 take away 10, which is 15. And P to C1 is the radius of the smallest circle, which is 10. So that means that the ratio, probably don't need to do all of this, is 15 to 10, so that's 3 to 2. Only two marks for that. Hence or otherwise determine the coordinates of P. I think at this point I'll put in that a C2 and a C1, even though they're on the outside as well. Well, knowing the coordinates of those two points, you know how far you've got to go from one to the other, and to get to P, you're going to go three-fifths of the way. Maybe I'll set it out this way. To get to P, I would go to C2 first, and then go three-fifths of the way from C2 to C1. I've already got the centre of two up here, negative 7, 11. Three-fifths of, and I'll just quickly work out, C2 to C1 which is here, negative 7 to 13 is 20, 11 to negative 4 is back 15, so that means it should be then, well, 3 fifths of 20 is 12, take away 7 is 5, 
3 fifths of negative 15 is negative 9 with the 11 makes 2. So P is the point 5, 2. Then we come to the last part. P is the centre of a third circle. There's a third circle centred on P. And it's just this bit of wording here. C2 touches this new circle internally. So what's the equation of C3? Now the problem here lies on the, on the wording. If it said C2 and C3 touch internally, there could be two possibilities. But does it mean by saying C2 touches C3 internally that C2's got to be on the inside of it, so it excludes one of them? So that instead of the smaller one, put C3 there so that they touch internally. There's also the case where if you, when you take a larger circle through P and let it grow so it envelops C2, they also would touch internally so that it would touch here. Well, those are certainly two candidates if it just said C2 and C3 touch internally. There's the case where C3 is smaller. There's the case where C3 is larger. They've both got internal tangent points. So which one is it? Well, they've both got the same centre, so as far as C3 is concerned, the equation is going to start x minus 5 squared plus y minus 2 squared equals whatever the radius is. If it's the smaller one, the radius is 10, the same as this. So that'll be 100 when you square it. If it's the larger one, the radius would be, well, the distance from P to the centre is 15, the larger circle was 25, so that's 40 altogether, so that would be 40 squared, which would be 1600. Now they're both equal candidates for C2 and C3 touching internally, but there's a bit of semantics here. It doesn't say C2 and C3 touch internally, it specifically says C2 touches C3 internally. And so after a brief discussion with an acquaintance Donald, who fits tyres at the weekend and so is intimately aware of these situations, he suggests that that actually means the latter case, because C2 has to touch C3 internally, and I must admit I would tend to go with that one as what they mean in this case, since they're just talking in the singular rather than either of those. So. I'll go with this one here, but presumably the marking scheme, because it's just a matter of semantics, would accept either of those for that sole last mark that was in part C.